We've been here before, fighting the problems that fight back, because we see opportunities where others see obstacles. We're change makers and problem solvers, uniting over one million minds to address complex issues facing communities around the world, including yours. We're working together as partners and professionals, while making friendships that last a lifetime. We're Rotary, and there's no limit to what we can do. Appreciate everyone coming here today. So while you're standing, why don't you uh, say a warm hello to those standing around you for just a minute. Okay, we've got a great program today, so let's go ahead and get started. Kathy Grell's gonna lead us in our invocation. Luann Bielinger's gonna lead us in our four-way test and pledge. And then Ed, past president Ed Monette's gonna introduce our visitors. Kathy? Will you join me in prayer? Once again, Lord, we come asking, is it the truth? Help us to discern truth from falsehood that we might live with a moral compass and lead others in our community. Is it fair to all concern? Help us to put others' needs ahead of our own. Will it build goodwill, uh, goodwill and better friendships? instill in us a working relationship of service above self? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? With your truth and fairness, it will be beneficial to our neighbors. So we thank you for all of our blessings of food and fellowship. Always keep us mindful that if we're blessed, we're called to be a blessing to others. In his name, amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's the first Rotary Day that we're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of the song, we're going to recite the four-way test together, and we're going to do this once a month. Uh, the four-way test was created in the 30s by a businessman trying to save his business from bankruptcy, and then Rotary adopted it in the 40s, and it's our non-sectarian ethical guide. So when you hear the words of the things we think, say, or do, then we'll recite it. And there should be a slide uh, of the four-way test. And then it's also on the wall if you need to follow that. So, of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concern? Thank you. And now if you'll join uh, with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. I am going to uh, briefly introduce our host Rotarians and their visitors and if you will briefly stand so that people can stare at you and sit back down and we'll get through this. We have quite a few visitors today. Rotarian Kara Gay Neal has brought with her Rena Cox with Vocal Authority which is a leadership voice training company. Tim Caldwell has uh, two floors of Williams employees. Uh, one is Barb Hasbini, Sam Smith, Abby Cutter, Allison Anthony, and Nicole Nazinsi. And with them are two high school shadows. So if we turn the light on, you can't see them, but they're shadows. And there it's Jamie Black and Natalie Walker. Lawrence Burley with Kittitut Consulting is here with Tony Oliva. Sandra Mullins has brought Elion Hurtado with Arvest. Rhonda Renz has two guests from Cirrus Payroll. We have Allison Hutchings and Tyler Wynn. And uh, we were turning away all visiting Rotarians, so there's none there. So let's welcome all our guests today. Thank you, and please come back. Thank you, Kathy, Luann, and Ed. Appreciate that. And welcome, visitors. We hope you'll feel welcome here today and will uh, consider joining us. If you're looking for a place to make some great friends, uh, make some really good business contacts, uh, maybe realize some personal improvement, and of course, serve your community. This is the place to be. 
Uh, we Rotarians are all about service above self, and we'd love to have you on our team. Now, please join me in recognizing and thanking this week's Rotary sponsors. Casey King with uh, Double Tree by Hilton, John Dale, Dick Gable and Jeff Hassel with Gable Gottwalls, Forrest Cameron with the Greater Tulsa Reporter newspaper, and Robert Parker, attorney. So here at the Rotary Club of Tulsa, we're all about community service, but we mean business when we're back at our jobs. So please join me in uh, doing work with your fellow Rotarians. So in addition to today's, today's sponsors, uh, please join me in thanking all of our volunteers whose committed service makes our meetings run smoothly week after week. Thank you, volunteers. Okay, moving along. Uh, announcements today. Club Foundation trustees will be meeting in room 233. And I have one other announcement. Uh, the, I announced this last week. The request for proposals for the communications PR firm that we're going to hire went out early this week. Again, if you know anyone that you think should receive that, please email, send an email to communications at tulsarotary.com. So, Rotary's a, an easy place to, to find um, heroes. Uh, I have several Rotary heroes, and one of my Rotary heroes is Bob McKenzie. And I've asked Bob to come up today and spend a few minutes talking about his latest relay across America. Uh, you know, Bob, Bob has a heart for all things Rotary but he particularly has a heart for helping Rotary in its quest to eradicate polio. I mean, this guy spends countless hours on his bike in hot weather, cold weather, riding, riding, riding. I, I called him last week, and he answered his phone, and I was like, I could hear some background noise, and I'm like, where are you? And he says, I'm on my way to Henrietta in my bike, and I'm like, so what are you going to do when you get there? He said, turn around and come back. I'm like, <laughs> dude. So he spends countless hours uh, helping raise money to, again, help eradicate polio. So Bob, you want to come up to the podium here? Well, thank you, President Mike, for this time. Uh, as all of you know, we did Race Across America. We had um, a four-man team that went across, and we were able to raise $550,000 for polio this year. I think we have a slide up there that has some of the particulars that we went through. This year was totally different from last year. Last year, we didn't have any weather or anything. And uh, this year we had, I had a sandstorm hit me the first night. Um, we had horrendous rains Friday and Saturday as we were finishing. And uh, we broke two bicycles. We had four flats. I mean, it, it, we, we were doing it all this year. Uh, one of the nice things this year is we had Rotarians greet us along the route. We had been on an email campaign with over 300 clubs that are along the route or were in Oceanside or Annapolis. And um, we had uh, the, several of them come out and greet us. In fact, our own district governor uh, came out and greeted us in Iola because she's in that club. And so um, that really uh, gave us some encouragement to do what we're going to do, and that is go again. So I need some help if there are any uh, doctors in here that can help me. Uh, we might need that. Um, we need support, of course, to pay for the team's expenses. So if your company or someone you know could help us, it takes about $55,000 to do that. And uh, so we're already in the process of raising money. So if you have someone that you want me to talk to that could probably help us, we'd be glad to do it. Um, I don't have a lot of time. We're going to show you a video that uh, President Mike wants to show, but I do want to tell you two things. Two years ago, I brought in a guy from Austria. His name is Kurt Matzler. He is a professor. He is an author. 
and he's a great racer. He's, he's probably one of our best riders. And I told him the other day I, I, on, our, on one of our Skype calls, I said that I sure was glad he had joined our team. And his response to me was, it has changed my life. And he's been a Rotarian, but now he is really involved in polio eradication. And so the other thing that I want to tell you is on Saturday morning at 3 a.m., when I was riding, I was, on, I was on the course, I was riding, freezing to death. It was about 60 degrees. It was pouring down rain so bad. Jack was in the car behind us. Jack McGlumphy was in our, on our crew. And they told me they could not see me very well, but they could see my light flashing. And uh, that's how hard the rain was coming down. And it was miserable out there. And I tell you, I, I could have quit. And the thought came to my mind that kids that contract polio, they don't get to quit. They're in it for life. And so we, we realized we could finish that race and did. And so I want your help. Uh, to continue to give to polio. Maybe some of y'all can help us sponsor the team, but please continue to give to polio. It's not over yet. We've had eight cases this year. We did have an outbreak in Syria caused by uh, the vaccine. We have 23 cases there, but we only have eight cases in, uh, in our endemic countries this year. So please don't give up on us and help us continue to get rid of this horrible disease. I'll turn it back Video's over to you, Mike. Working. And, there I am. So I have some certificates to, to hand out, too, uh, from uh, now past District Governor Don Dendas. Uh, these are certificates of appreciation for some of our members from our club who have gone above and beyond in supporting the end polio program. And uh, I want you to know, too, our club uh, received a certificate from Don, so, so that's pretty cool. We'll keep that in the office. But if I could get, uh, come up here to the podium, Becky Fields, Corey Nickerson, there you are, uh, Philip Viles, still here today? I didn't see him, okay. Brad Anthem Adam, is Brad not here? Okay, well, Corey and Becky. Okay, let's give them a round of applause. So Bob, thanks again for all you're doing. I know you've, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, buy Bob lunch or breakfast. Uh, he's got a real story to tell. <laughs> or dinner, yeah. Uh, he's got a real story to tell. And uh, like I say, he's got a, he's got a heart for, for what Rotary's doing. And, and we are that close. There have been, as Bob said, eight cases so far this year. Uh, so we're heading in the right direction, but at the Rotary International Conference, uh, I think we've already talked about this, they made an announcement uh, that we need 1.5 billion, with a B, dollars to finish the job. And they need that much money because it's, it's down to three countries now, and these villages, that uh, they still need to uh, uh, give the uh, vaccination to the people in the villages. Are, these are remote villages, and they're hard to get to, and then once a country is is been denoted as polio free, it has to go. I believe it's two or three more years before it's official. And so we still got a ways to go, uh, but but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay, Sarge, right. Sir Seacrest. How's it going? It's going. We got got two mics because it's going to get kind of crazy here in a second. We're ahead of schedule, man. Right. You got Are we time. Ahead of yeah. Gee, I'll relax then. All right, wonderful. How's everybody doing? Kind of, let's liven up. It's Wednesday, you know. <laughs> you know, we got a youngster over here who's taking Miguel's place, and he's doing a great job of, uh, you know, doing right, okay? All right, good. All right, here we go. So it's Sarge time. We're excited to have you all here, and let's get to it. Uh, let's see here. First of all, Karen Keith, uh, she's such a sweetheart. Uh, she wanted us to... Uh, 
provide a memory of Claudette Rogers. Claudette was a member of our club for several years, and I had an opportunity to meet her when I first came on board. She was very nice to me, and obviously a great picture with Tom, our friend over here. And uh, anyway, she uh, wanted to take a pay a fine to be able to do a remembrance of that. So I thought that was really sweet there. I'm doing a little announcement today, too, for Terry Heritage. Um, school's coming up here pretty fast, and she does the adopt a classroom. We've already have a couple people from our club who have already donated to help with classroom supplies. Uh, it's very important. You know how difficult it is, even across the, the uh, city of Tulsa, to raise these monies for these supplies. So I encourage everyone to consider uh, reaching out to Terry or even our Rotary office if you would like to donate to have those supplies. All right. And then, okay, here's where it gets crazy. Where, is Joe Moran here? Wow. Where's Joe? Tell me Joe's here. Joe, come on up here, buddy. No, you're not going to get to sit there. <laughs> come on up, Come Joe. on, no, come I on. know. Come on. Come on. So Joe call, sends me an email, I guess it was 9.30 Monday night, saying he wants to, you know, pay a fine for his birthday, $250. And he says something in it, and I wasn't around, I, at least, well, you, you wouldn't believe the things we find on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm glad that's what you showed. You're, okay, all right. So Joe explains to me that, I guess about five years ago, for his 60th birthday, our Sergeant Large back then, which is David Downing, took a song for his 60th birthday, and for us younger people, I'm going to include myself, it's 60 and you know it, so I won't say what the real song is, but anyway, it's nonetheless, he did a very good job of that. So I was tasked to come up with a 65th birthday song, okay? And he sent me a video. To be honest with you, I watched that video, and it creeped me out a little bit. In fact, I think I was up to about 2 a.m. in the morning. I was going to show it here, but I didn't want to have anybody question anything. And, and he's such a manly guy. The guy cracks, you know, he's, he's, he's cracking watermelon with your hands, I bet. So anyway, so we wanted to do a manly song. So how many people know Rawhide? Yeah. Right, Rawhide. That's a pretty good manly song. You good with that? I'm going to, do you know how to make a whip sound? Okay, good. I'm going to bring, okay, you two are the whip song. I whip. hear it from my wife all the time. You, oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, so here we go. Oh, so do it. And I've got to do this because I've sang this song so much in my car driving around that I'm afraid I'm going to screw it up because I know the actual words and <laughs> So excuse me, real quick. So you guys ready? You know it starts off with that. All right, get my country song on. This is for you, Joe. This is $250 worth, by the way. <laughs> worth every penny. Yeah, every penny. Okay, y'all ready? They're rolling, rolling, rolling through the streams are swollen. Joe, keep them years of rolling. 65. <laughs> Don't try to understand them, yeah. just rope them, throw them, and brand them. Yeah. Soon you'll be living high and wide. Your heart's calculating, your security check will soon be waiting. Be waiting at the end of your ride. Move them on, head them up, head them up, move them on, move them on, head them up, bro. Oh, 65. Ride them in, let them out, let them out, ride them out. 65. There's a bit more. <laughs> keep moving, 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 though they're disapproving. Keep those birthdays moving. 65. Yeah. Through rain and wind and weather, hell been and forever. Wishing another birthday, get to five. <laughs> You'll get that in about 10 years. <laughs> all the things you're getting, good vittles, love, and singing. <laughs> of all because you're turning 65. <laughs> Move them up, hit them on, hit them up, move them on, move them on, hit them up. Raw hide. Or 65. Or 65. Cut them out, ride them in, ride them in, cut them out. Ride them yeah. in, 65. Yeah. No more in, 65 yeah. people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. See, now you guys got to come back in five years, and I don't know who the Sergeant Arms is going to be at that time, but 70. Not too. He'll come out pretty fast. Thank you, David, for helping out there. And I think we have one more slide here. Uh, oh, this is, if, if Joe hadn't shown up today, and I would have had to do that without, you know, th this happened to me last week when I went to my class. So anyway, it speaks for itself. Anyway, thank you all. I appreciate you all keeping us in mind. Obviously, this raises money for our foundation and thrilled to help you out anyway. And yes, I will go crazy if you want me to. So all right, you all have a great day. Thanks. So now I'm really starting to get concerned. You've got a sidekick there. <laughs> Whew, I don't know. This could get interesting. I think we're still ramping up here.
But thanks, thanks, and happy birthday, Joe. Terry, thanks for all you do out at Sealy Clinton. Uh, you, you're one of those tireless behind the scene workers that uh, doesn't need the limelight, but uh, we appreciate everything you do for the teachers and the kids out there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our Rotarian of the day. Past President Tim Caldwell is back for a return engagement as Rotarian today. I think he's kind of liking this attention. Yeah. yeah. So Tim was uh, president of our club in 2007, 2008, and he co-chaired our club's 2015 Centennial Committee. And then he was co-author of our club's history, Celebrate 100 Years of Rotary in Tulsa. And if you don't have a copy of that book, get with the office. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I think we still may have some copies. So we'd, it's a great book. It's, it, you can, it's a good book to spend some time in and, and, and review the history of our club and, and, and to appreciate where we've come from. One of the neat things about Tim is, and I'm so, so envious of this because I love baseball, Tim and his son Matt are on this quest to visit all 30 of the Major League Baseball parks. And they've already been to 19 of them. And I just think that's got to be such an adventure to do with your son. I just, I, I admire you for doing that and encourage you to, only 11 more to go, man. You're almost there. Keep at it. So please join me in welcoming to the podium past president, Tim Caldwell. Thank you, President Mike. Well, uh, when's the last time you had an interaction with a business and their response was well beyond what you thought it really would be. Well, that's what today's speaker aspires for his clients who are thrust into thorny land use and stakeholder relations issues. Jay Vincent is founder and chief engagement officer for Chicago-based Outreach Experts. He brings to clients innovative opinion research and citizen advocacy tools and consulting. Jay is a good friend. We first worked together uh, many years ago as Williams sought drilling permits in a contentious corner of the Barnett Shale. But today, Jay will tell us another side of his story about being the son of a Chicago cop and all the tradition and honor that comes with that. So now, let's hear how we can make our businesses act more like an individual. Fellow Rotarians, let's give a warm Tulsa welcome to Jay Vincent. Good afternoon, everybody. I have to say it's really an honor to be here today. Um, I, I grew up with a mantra. I didn't know if I called it a mantra when I was a 10-year-old kid, but something in my upbringing really resonated with me, and it was this concept of, if not me, then who? And often, as Tim mentioned, I, I, I run a company, and I'm, I'm in the business of, of giving advice to companies who need to be taught a different way on how to do things. But when you come and speak to a Rotary Club, you find the four-way test, you find service above self, and what I have really found is a problem for myself. What do I come and talk to you about? What do I come and try to convince you of that I hold dear to my heart? And, and in the end, I don't think there's anything with this group that I can do that, so I think the best way to proceed is with my story and to tell you about how the things I think that you hold dear and true when, when shared with a young person um, can really have an impact. And I, and I found that, especially with my clients, the most important thing is showing them that it works. And it works if you work it. Um, some may understand what I mean by that, and I think many of you, you will get it if you listen to my talk today. So thank you very much. As a Chicagoan, I am blessed to be here as well. Um, I understand that this is where this organization was born. And I like to say I come from the city of, of big shoulders. And I think those city, that city of big shoulders is uh, really as a result of the Rotarians and the work that they've done in the city of Chicago. And the reason that term is so near and dear to my heart is because of my story. 1983, my dad was a Chicago police officer. He became a Chicago police officer in late 79, um, following a tradition of his family. His father, his grandfather, all Chicago police officers. And then what I learned is his great-grandfather actually was a police officer in Chicago. But in 1983, I found the generosity of strangers. And that generosity of strangers was through an organization called the 100 Club 
of Chicago. I wear a pin for them today because the 100 Club of Chicago showed up at my front door around 9 o'clock on a Friday night in January of 1983. And uh, I haven't told this story publicly often. Um, this is going to be one of the first times I've ever really talked about it outside of the community of families like mine. My dad was killed that evening, and the 100 Club came with a check. They came with a heart, and they came with their big shoulders. And 30 years later, actually 33 years later now, um, I'm a member of that organization, obviously, but I'm on their board. My brothers have, um, and I, have started a foundation project inside the 100 Club to give back, to pay it forward, however you want to talk about it. But as I reflect on my story, um, and I think about my life, I know what my mission has to be. So in that context, and I really want to give you that context, because my story and the kind of way that I've coped with life since then is so oddly aligned with who you all purport to be and who you are and show up as in the world. So throughout my talk today, I'm going to lean on that a bit. Um, I'm going to lean on the importance of looking back. I'm going to lean on the importance of looking forward, looking up, and then making sure of what those three things tell me are reflective of my values. So I'm going to flip through some slides here. Obviously, my name is Jay Vincent, and, and I'm grateful to be here. And I want to talk to you about my story, because it's about how authenticity matters in today's day and age. There's so much dissonance out there, companies saying they're doing great things, but having poor activities, saying they will donate monies, but those monies never arrive. And what people are excellent at is spotting inauthenticity. There's a variety of ways to describe it, but people know when they're being misled. And more and more, as I work in the world, I'm finding people are often misled. They feel misled. And that dissonance damages communities. And companies have long struggled to deal with this issue, right? They don't know how to act like an individual. They know how to achieve their goals. They know how to um, get a good quarterly statement. They know how to make tough decisions about how to run their business. And all of those things are foreign to people in their everyday lives. Yet, the decision-making patterns inside a big company are very similar to the decision-making patterns that individuals make. So how can we inspire the companies we work for, the companies in our communities, to act more like an individual? Well, the first thing we can help them do is be like a person. Be radically reflective about how you have lived up to the things you espouse are important to you. And radical reflectiveness is, a, is an honesty, I think, that not many people can really claim to have uh, uh, perfected, right? Radical reflectiveness and honesty is a process of constantly looking back at what you have done. Does it align with what you say you are, with what you are, and what the world knows you to be, right? So reflectiveness in the corporate context is going to be looking back at the corporate social responsibility statements that they've shared and said the goal, communicate the goals that they have set for themselves and look back and say, are they actually living those goals? Are they living those values? And sadly, many companies aren't. Companies are, and they do so on a daily basis. Sometimes we hear about them. Many times we don't. So what I, what I counsel here is, be like a person here, company. If you're reflective and you find things out about yourself, tell that story. Tell your history, right? The etymology of history is his story, right? They say to the victor goes the story, right? So those that are the victors in war get to tell the story of what really happened there. And so be communicative about how you're reflecting upon the things that you do. Um, and if we can do this as individuals, we can show our companies that we work for um, how to do this themselves by sharing it in the context of um, maybe a story about themselves. So really it's about boiling down this, these learnings you have about your behavior, these learnings you have about your performance, et cetera, really boiling those down into a kind of a human context for folks. So looking back is so important. And what you're going to find here as I talk about this, and, and is that there are actually four kind of ways to plan this and to use this little mini system that I, I use for myself in my daily life. Um, and I find it 
very similar to your four-way test. And, and when I saw this, I, I really, being a Chicagoan, I don't know much about rot Rotary, to be honest. Um, the more I learn, the more I, I, I see very similarities to the ways that I view the world. Um, so you're going to see my four ways that I test whether or not I'm living properly, and then I, how I use those to help companies understand that they can find a better way. So be radically reflective. Now, if we're being radically reflective, we... That looks like some slides got out of order. I'm sorry about that. We can look forward <laughs> with real honesty and say, here's how I've performed in the past, and here is where I want to go. So past is prologue, right? We know that our past dominates where we are in the present. But where we want to go in the future may be different than what our experience is in, in, in the past. So live purposely is what I uh, counsel. And what I mean by live purposely is live honestly, share that honesty and that radical reflectiveness with people. Do not be, ash do be ashamed to tell, tell your story. When companies fix what is broken, that is a story that's positive. That is a story that needs to be communicated so that folks are able to um, know that they can join in with a responsible company and help them achieve that message or, or achieve that mission. So looking beyond, really, the past into your future is, is, uh, is, is a key in teaching companies on how to be inspired, number one, but to act like an individual. Now, companies are wonderful at planning their futures. They know how to um, slate out the next two, three years, how to project forward five years, and, and make all sorts of projections for what their profits may look like. But do they know how to set their goals that are aligned truly with their values? Now, often, you hear this concept of a lack of alignment, right? So consultants and, and my friends at Williams will tell you, I will dive into the consultant speak from time to time. Um, but the, the uh, real goal here is to set your plans aligned with the purposeful, deliberate ideas you have about how you want the world to view you and who you believe you are. And companies, sadly, are great at doing this with branding, um, but they are not good at doing this with their core values and showing them off to the world. So I'm going to go back a slide, because when I look back on my life, I know that I have almost a debt to pay, um, a debt more so than money, um, a debt that needs to be shared, frankly, with my siblings. It needs to be shared, my story needs to be shared with other families who need our help. Um, but more importantly, um, I need to look back so I know what I need to do with my next step. And often, to know what my next step is, we have to look up. For some, that means looking to God. For some, it means to look to our highest aspirations, whether or not you are a Christian or a Muslim or whatnot. It, it doesn't really matter. All of us have ideals that are greater than ourselves. So companies need to be shared that in very simple human ways. If anybody, and, and let me ask this, and then pause and ask the group this. For those of you that are still in the workforce and know your company's value statements, the things that they purport to the public markets, the things that they purport to their customers, do you feel that they live up to those completely? Folks can raise their hand if they think. That's not even 15% of the room. Now that might be a little bit of shyness, so I'm willing to say that 30% of companies are, are living up to their values. Now, they don't do this alone. They do this with people that are dedicated to their brand, dedicated to their company, long-term employees, new employees, et cetera. And today, we talk about these folks as ambassadors. So when looking at this, and I also talk about looking up, but I also talk about standing on top of those ideals. Companies can look across all the 360 evaluations that they do, and they will not, using the tactics they use today, they will not find the real important influential ambassadors that are there ready for them to be used as those ambassadors to, 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 to rep their brand, so to speak. So when individuals want to impact the way that their company is behaving, is acting in the world, they need to be an example of what that company says they are to the world, right? So 
if a company says that they are hiring, um, committed to hiring veterans, but the employee sees that that is not the case, that veterans are not new entrants into their company, that rather that's just a marketing ploy, it is up today, it is up to the employee, it is a responsibility of that employee to share that dissonance with the company. And so that one though is difficult to, to show um, the company that they um, are representing that, that value, right? Because who's gonna go out and hire a veteran? It's not like many people have a side company or whatnot, but there is one key way that many companies, many individuals rather, can help their companies live up to some of their highest aspirations, and it's with volunteerism. So when I talk about being the, that apex, being that example of the person standing on the peak of the aspiration that the company has, when you are out volunteering and you are out living your company's values, which I know, and I look across the room, and I see my familiar friends' faces here from Williams, and I see my friend Scott Phillips, uh, Scott rather, um, from uh, many past. Uh, a long, it's been a long time since we've seen each other. So, I uh, we we need to be this example, and that's really what I'm trying to to share with you is is when you look up, you want to look up to that aspiration that you have. You want to achieve that, but you also want to stand on top of it and show others, show your company that you are indeed looking and you are indeed solving the challenge that they have tried to solve because what you want to show them undoubtedly is that you are a reflection of your company's values. So what you being a reflection of those values will enable that company to do is to enhance its accountability. You know, companies are built to make money. Right? But today, we want them to do so much more. We want them to be social actors. We want them to be motivators of change in society, et cetera. And the burdens, frankly, that have been put on companies over the years are, are growing and growing. But yet, we don't look at them as burdens. Right? These are becoming responsibilities. So it's essential that we hold these companies to, um, to a higher standard to the standards that they've communicated, right, to the world. Because if you look back, and you can do this yourselves, right, if we are gonna teach our companies how to be responsible actors in society, often we only need to look as far as their last annual report, right? In their last annual report, if they're a publicly traded company, you can go and find the things they say are their goals, the things that they say are their values, the commitments that they have made to community, right? So if we can look back at this, we now have something to hold them accountable to, right? And now if we're in a position of influence, and if we're or in a position of power, or even if we're just the lowest rung on the pole, we will generally understand if the company is operating properly, operating in a healthy manner, we will understand that there is a plan. And we will see this plan in action, right? This is us looking forward, using the values that we have in our heart, using the values that we state to the public, that is part of the plan that is taking us forward into the future. And there, we may even see dissonance, or we may see alignment. Either way, we need to be individuals that are living those values as well if we want to inspire companies to act like individuals. Um, so, individuals, right, people have a memory, um, have a real human memory. They remember what we talked about with uh, uh, our friend at the last dinner, right? So if we're going to inspire companies to be like individuals, give them a memory. So my, the folks I've worked with will tell you, I, I do a lot of what's called CRM work. I help companies detail their history with people, customers, clients, land agents, etc. The interactions that happen between the company and people, when we record that, we are creating an, an organizational memory. So we talk about that as is building organizational memory. Organizations are horrible at that. You know, when companies lose key staff, what do they talk about? Oh, all of this institutional memory is gone. When institutional memory is gone, customers are upset because they know that there is a starting point to this conversation, right? So they know that there is this history they've had and their expectation stated or unstated, is that you must know what I have already talked to you about. We've all been bummed when some customer service organization has no idea 
about the 45 minutes you just spent on the phone with them, or the two days you spent trying to get a live person on the phone. If that's recorded, that memory is there to be used for the next person. And when people see that that organization has a memory, they do begin to treat that organization more healthy because they recognize that it's acting in a more humane, a more human, intimate way, right? So a building an organizational memory is, is, is essential. Now, people, that's, that's looking back, right? But people are, are very similar um, when looking forward. They have plans, right? They have intent. And so when we look forward and we go to make those plans, we, we move with deliberate clarity. Now, that translated into the corporate world is don't waste people's time, right? Make sure that when you're communicating with an organization, a person, that you have a purpose, that there's a reason for that communication, not just you're checking the box. This is difficult, um, frankly, for companies that have lots and lots of contact to make with, with people and customers. But even just small tweaks will enable you to have a more meaningful relationship, so to speak. Now, if we know what our history is, we have our organization in memory, we have our plan, um, and we have kind of this, this, this process, this path that we're moving along, then we know we need to set high goals. And when we're thinking about that, that kind of mountain, right, and I'll go back to it here just for a second, set high aspirations and set high human aspirations. Organizations are great at saying, hey, we're gonna increase revenue year over year by 30%, or we're gonna set you know, a, a, uh, an earnings per share of, of, with 3% growth for next year. Organizations are perfect at that. But that is an aspiration only for an investor. Does that resonate with someone's humanity? I, I don't think it does. And I think most people don't think it does. So more and more we hear this word about corporate social responsibility out there, right? So um, set high aspirations. Now, the thing is, if you're going to set high aspirations and you're going to live your values, so to speak, that also means that you need to be accountable. And so, you know, when I left business school and I went to, um, I, I chose the, the business school based on its tagline. And the tagline was, ask more of business. Um, because that very much resonated with, with me. I, I think that business has a higher responsibility to society than it's paying today. And I very much believe that's kind of synonymous with my personal belief of, if not me, then who? So I chose to go to this school. And it helped me remember something that I had learned all the way back in college during a, a philosophy class about Martin Heidegger, or where I learned about Martin Heidegger. And, um, you know, he, he wrote a book called Being in Time. And he uh, talked about how we as humans are meaning-making machines, that we truly are the ones that, that make all the meaning in our world. We make words mean things. We, make, we give words to shapes, we give words to groups of people, et cetera. And so we are meaning-making machines. Now, if people can share that with companies, if people can teach companies how to be responsible, meaning-making machines, because in reality, the biggest meaning-making machine today is our commercial world, is the power of brands, et cetera. But if we can look at meaning in a different way, we can find, I think, a better way to live, a better way to make sure that we are living our objectives, we are living our values. And so um, I wanna share with you how we can use this process of looking back, looking in front of us, making sure we're, we're straight um, with uh, our aspirations and our, our higher beliefs, and then be able to really easily ground them in some sort of checklist. And that's really what my, my logo, when I, when, I, when I created this, what I wanted it to signify is that at some point we need to make sure that we check what we are doing is aligned with the things that we say we are. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like my, my, my personal checklist in a way. So I want to share with you how I would, um, knowing my story now, I want to share with you how I'd use this system to um, make sure what I do in my life is, is the right thing. And so first I look back and I share the story of my dad, right? Um, and the organization, the 100 Club, that came with a check for $50,000, put me through undergrad, 
um, put me through business school and, and really helped um, my mom um, always be a, a, until she got remarried, a single mom who didn't have to go out and work. She was able to raise us because of this organization. So I know my history tells me that I have some sort of responsibility to the future. So I moved back to Chicago um, after being in Washington, D.C., working for seven years. And the, one of the first things I did was reach out to this organization to make sure that I figured out some way to participate, some way to give back to an organization that had given so much to me. Um, and so along that path, I'm trying to live up to what has been given in the past. Now, if I look at what I've done since I went to business school and came back to Chicago, I can tell you that we created the Larry J. Vincent Memorial Scholarship, right? And we set our aspirations very high to create that. And it would be a, a scholarship for young people whose father or mother was killed in the line of duty who wanted to go to a private school. Um, I was able to go to a private school. There was a little bit of money that we had to pay um, because the club and the state of Illinois didn't pay for it. Um, so our scholarship today covers that gap, right? So I look at the past, I see a responsibility, I reach out and I say, I, I need to find some way to, to continue to help. There isn't an easy way, so we created, we created that. The club didn't want, until me and my brothers, the club didn't want families to give back. They wanted them to know that this was just there for you. And we convinced them to think otherwise, and today there are a half a dozen scholarships like this at the 100 Club, like ours. And so I see that aspiration, and frankly, I, I stand on top of that, that, that mountain now, and I, and, I, and I can tell my brothers, I can tell my family, I can tell all the people in my personal life that this is what we have achieved, right? And then when I look back at that reflection and I look at my personal checklist, I say, well, I have indeed lived my values, right? I have indeed done the things that I have said I was going to do. Um, bringing that level of accountability of you know, looking back, looking forward, looking up towards the, the greater good, and, and then finding yourself it, that, finding yourself in that moment of achieving that aspiration is, is, is certainly a place that we don't get alone. And by no means um, am I great for having got where we got. Um, I'm here because I simply was willing to do it. I was simply willing to ask that question, if not me, then who? So I want to tell you that I'm very grateful, again, for being here today. And I know that I have just 30 seconds left, and I, and I want to tell you that there is meaning to be found everywhere. The first book I read in business school was by a gentleman named Leo Tolstoy, um, and the book was The Death of Ivan Ilyich. Has anybody read that book? It, it changed my life. Um, Ivan Ilyich lived two lives. He lived one that was public and one that was private, and neither of them were fulfilling. And so know that we have things about ourselves that always kind of are below what we show to the world, and that's okay. But most of who we are needs to be shown. It needs to be, have a bright light shown on it so that we can benefit, so that others can benefit. So when I look today to see that the book that was being given to a school on my behalf was um, adapted from a Leo Tolstoy story, that is meaningful. And the only way that that is meaningful is if you tell the story, right? Because no one else is gonna get that unless it's told. The same goes for everything that you do in your life, and the same thing that goes for everything that the companies that you work for do. Don't be afraid to stand on top of the mountain and shout from the highest heights that you are doing great things in the world, because you are, and I'm so proud to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much. If anybody has any questions, I would love to, uh, please, Scott. Good to see you. One hundred percent. I left my previous business, which you know me from, um, because I knew after I left business school that uh, I that whatever I did for companies had to be about moving something more than just the company's agenda forward. And so that's why I left. I, I left to create outreach experts because we wanted to bring some good to the world, not just some capital and some, uh, some profit. Please. You know, controversy. Um, they're living through a 
very difficult time with a stakeholder group that's important to the way they operate, whether it's a landowner, a group of disgruntled shareholders, um, a community that might be up in arms about your business, something along those lines. It's typically controversy, um, and we seize on that simply because that's the, the quickest way often to solve a problem is to live through a crisis and know that you don't ever want to do that again. Our, our, our best work is done um, when we have a company or an organization that is that knows it's at the cusp of change and isn't confronted with um, their bet the firm kind of uh, dilemma yet, because then we can really take time to uh, look at what's happened in the past and figure out with them how, what they want to be, and then take a you know create a program to move forward. But it's often painful controversy. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, I was in New Zealand earlier this year um, working with uh, the Auckland City Council on um, basically creating new engagement techniques for um, dealing with folks online. Some of the most exciting online public participation work in the world is going on in, in uh, Australia and New Zealand. So I was out there earlier this year working with an association, a city government or a council government and uh, a private company. Um, and I work in Canada today um, with a company in Vancouver and um, but I've done I've done work on four continents at this point. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Wow, that's a great question. Oh, the oh the question was, what is your most important success story? Wow, I, I, I don't, I don't want to, I fairly, I don't want to talk about my client that's in the room, but we've had so many really great success stories there. And I, let, let, me, let me say it this way, a, a hospital used to be a very welcome thing in a community. Um, people would want to live close to it. And today that's not the case. So I, I helped a level one trauma center once um, deal with um, the difficult questions around helicopter traffic and noise and, and doing the one-on-one work one-on-one -on -one work with the neighborhood uh, to get them to relent and to, to see that sometimes we do need to have uh, a shared sacrifice. That's, that was rewarding work. Um, I, I want to tell you that, that uh, it, we, we ended up winning that through litigation. Um, so we didn't win the vote we needed to win right away, but when it came to litigation and the group that we had put together, um, the community group eventually relented and, and we won, but not after litigation. No. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Have you thought of representing any Chicago-based airlines that might drag <laughs> Well, <laughs> I'd love to, because they'd have a whole new rate. <laughs> they'd have a whole new rate. I, uh, <laughs> they have to be willing to change. They have to be willing. That's such an important precursor to my work. Um, and I don't think that they're willing to change yet. So I, I'll just say this, and I know we, we should, we should uh, finish up, but I, I won't work for companies who don't want to change. Um, if they want to pay lip service to it, they can hire somebody else to do it. There's a lot of firms out there that'll do it. Um, and I just, I don't do that. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Jay, thank you. That was a very inspiring story, and, and you, you obviously have a heart for what you do, and, and we appreciate that. We appreciate that there are people like you that are out there that, that do want to make a change and will only work for companies that do want to change. That, that takes a lot, of, a lot of guts. There's a lot of work you probably turn away because of that, so good for you. Good for you. So yes, our book, uh, recognizing your, your time here today, that will uh, present to our partner in education school, Celia Clinton, is the three questions. So thank you for letting, letting us in on the background of that too. I appreciate that. So uh, real quick, on your tables, MSNI raffle tickets are for sale. It's not too early to buy these. We had a winner last week for, uh, yes. Are you using that iPad yet? No, not yet. <laughs> Okay, but so there's prizes to be won. So, so uh, ante up and buy a, buy a raffle ticket, please. So upcoming programs, uh, Stuart Price will be here next week uh, with his story uh, with Price Family Properties in 
kind of the reinvention of downtown that, that they're trying to do. That should be a really, really interesting story. I've heard him talk about that, and he's got some real passion there himself. And then the week after that, uh, we're going to talk about uh, next year is the new era for alcohol sales in Oklahoma. Woohoo! <laughs> wow, it's strange that we're talking about that in 2018, but here we are. And so that's going to be a great, great panel discussion. I probably crossed some political line there, but sorry. So yeah, bring a, bring a guest. And so I missed something there. I'll pick it up later, I'm sure. Okay, a bunch of drunks out there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you for coming today. Thank you to our visitors for coming. We hope you felt welcome. I uh, encourage you to go out, tell your Rotary story, and don't forget to bring a friend to Rotary next week. Thank you. <laughs>